casebook of Gregory Hood. Tonight, the Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to the story of The Double Diamond, another exciting adventure from the casebook of Gregory Hood. As for me, I'd like to tell you about a wonderful red wine. It's Petri California Burgundy. Now, there's a wine for you. That Petri Burgundy is really perfect. Serve it with any kind of meat or meat dish, and you'll see what I mean. It's a hearty red wine, just as rich in flavor as it is in color. So you couldn't find a better companion to a thick, juicy steak or a piping hot beef stew or a good hamburger. Petri Burgundy certainly has a way of turning a simple meal, like, say, a hamburger sandwich, into a feast. Believe me, here's a wine that's clear, fragrant, and delicious. A wine that you can serve to your friends proudly, Petri Burgundy. Remember those letters P-E-T-R-I spell the proudest name in the long history of fine wine. Petri. <laughs> It's Monday night in San Francisco, and we have a date with Gregory Hood and his good friend and attorney, Sanderson Taylor. Tonight's rendezvous is down on this city's colorful waterfront. There, with the backdrop of the bobbing, brightly tinted sails of the fishing boats, lies that mecca of seafood, Fisherman's Wharf. Harry Martell. Well, how are you? Evening, Mr. Taylor. Hello, Gregory. Hello, Harry. Sit down and join us. We were just discussing the merits of baked red snapper as compared to the subtler charms of bouillabaisse. <laughs> well, I'll be guided by you, Greg. I know this is one of your favorite hangouts. Well, I think you'd go for the snapper. They have a wonderful way of marinating the fish with lime juice, then icing it for several hours before cooking. Uh, look, Greg, while we're waiting to order... Oh, uh, okay, Harry. I can see that Monday night look in your eye. <laughs> you want a story from the case book? Check. Well, this particular adventure happened in February last. I had to go to New York to look over a collection of wonderful Gobelin tapestries that had just arrived from Europe. Sandy was afraid he might miss some fun, so he decided to come with me. <laughs> Don't you believe it, Harry. I went along because I'm Greg's attorney, and I'm scared of his making a deal without me there to advise him. <laughs> but go on, Greg. Well, whatever Sandy's motives were, we found ourselves sitting in the bar of the San Francisco airport waiting for our plane to be called, and that's when the story really began. I remember as we sat there downing an extremely smooth ferry that I was in a singularly garrulous mood. You know, Sandy, there are only two things I dislike about airplane travel. Eh? What are they? First, they allow you to smoke nothing but cigarettes. This is the last chance I'll have to enjoy this magnificent outsized hunk of briar until we land at Chicago. <laughs> well, the fact it should make the other passengers very happy. Oh. Uh, what's your second beef? That you're not allowed to date the stewardesses. They're always extremely delectable. I get so lonely up there in the clouds. Mm, you do all right. Now, I'll tell you the one thing I do like about plane travel. And what's that? It assures me, uh, for a few hours at least, that you will keep out of trouble. Well, dullness is restful in very small doses. But for a steady diet, I really... Hey, Sandy, look at this. Huh? Oh, it's just a paper napkin crumpled in the box. Look a little closer. Uh, somebody's drawn something on it and lipstick. Mm -hmm. Great Scott, it's... It's quite a good likeness of a cobra's head. Yes, Sandy, which happens to be the Hood and Company crest. A very neat way of attracting my attention. And uh, read on the other side. Let me see. Watch the Colonel. What do you suppose it means? Right? I don't know. It looks like beauty and distress, but there isn't a girl in the bar. Oh, I don't see any signs of a Colonel either. There's nothing over a captain in uniform here. Oh, wait a minute, Sandy. Get a load of that elderly gent with the droopy mustachios sitting in the corner. Oh, yes. He'd certainly fit the bill for a Kentucky colonel, wouldn't he? It's almost a caricature. <laughs> I do believe he's drinking a mint julep. He is. Come on, Sandy. Let's follow this through. Oh, and I said you'd be out of trouble for a few hours. Oh, I'm careful, sir. I'm terribly sorry, sir. Clumsy of me. I stumbled against your table. Let me order you another drink. Yeah, don't bother, sir. It was nearly finished. Oh, no, I insist. Uh, bartender, bring another drink here, please. Yes, sir. Coming up, sir. Yeah, that was very kind of you, not sir. Not at all, not at all. Uh, by the way, my name's Gregory Hood, and this is Mr. Sanderson Taylor. How do you do? And I, sir, am Colonel Tolliver from Virginia. Mighty glad to know you, sir. Mighty glad. 
Mr. Hood, sir, you all is the gentleman. Continental Airlines, flight number 234 for Chicago, New York, now loading at gate 6. Ah, that's our plane. Excuse us, Colonel. Then it's my plane, too, sir. I should be there in a few minutes. Very well, Colonel. We'll see you on it. Come on, Sandy. Okay, good. And goodbye to uh, you, sir. Here you are, bartender. You can take the gentleman's drink out of this. Keep the change. Thank you, sir. Well, Sandy, this trip may not be as dull as you hoped. The Colonel is a phony. His accent was unbelievable. And so was his grammar. He used you all in the singular. Which no genuine southerner would. Well, now we've got to track down the writer of the message. Perhaps she'll be on the plane, too. Well, if she is, how do you expect to spot her? By matching up her lipstick with the particular shade used on the napkin. Well, Gregory, I hope it'll look well on you. the colonel for over an hour now, nothing's happened. Me, I'm getting sleepy. I've been watching more than the colonel. Did you notice that girl sitting three seats behind us? Yes, even my tired old eyes spotted her. I also noticed that she was wearing quite a beautiful diamond pendant. Yes, yes, it's a splendid specimen, too. Uh, the diamond, that is. And so is the girl, but the most interesting thing about her is the, uh, fact... the uh, shade of lipstick. Elementary, my dear Taylor. It's a little hard to gauge the exact tint from here. I think a closer examination is indicated. I won't be a moment. Oh, sure. Yes, very well. I'll see you in Chicago. Hello. Were you speaking to me? It's all right. I got your message. You can consider the colonel watched. Uh, by the way, who is he? And for that matter, uh, who are you? I haven't the faintest notion of what you're talking about. Is your idea of a practical joke? I don't indulge in them. Uh, look up at me a minute, will you? Go away and don't bother me. Come on, be a pal. Look up at me. I'll ring for the stewardess if you don't go away. Look up, darling. Oh. Yep. Thank you. Wait, you... You kissed me. If you want to sue me, my attorney's sitting three seats ahead of me. Sleep well, well darling. Well, all the nerve. Back to soon, Greg. Don't tell me she uh, repulsed you. It's a funny thing. The girl pretended not to know me. Yet I'll swear her lipstick was the exact shade... Which might prove nothing, of course. Well, we'll soon see. I wipe off this delightful artificial rosebud I just stole <laughs> with the same napkin. So, how do they compare? Hmm. It's exactly the same shade, Sandy. Oh, that doesn't really prove she's the one that wrote the note. <laughs> I admit that it is an unusual shade of lipstick, but a hundred different girls might easily be using it. True, true. In fact, it doesn't really prove the note was written by a girl. A man could have taken a girl's lipstick and used it. Oh, yeah, it's just a fascinating you probably do. Yes, you're darn right it is. There's skullduggery going on in this plane, and I'll lay you dollars to a large stack of donuts that little Miss Goldilocks back of us is mixed up in it. Yes, for sure. Well, I'll let you take care of it. Uh, okay, Sandy, one of us is enough. I'll stay awake, though I'm not quite certain what for. <laughs> Please wake up, Mr. Hood. Hmm? Hmm? Oh. Oh. Hello. The stewardess. Don't tell me we're landing. No, Mr. Hood. But there's been trouble on the plane. Oh, really? I knew you were an amateur detective, and I hoped you'd help me. Well, I'll do my best. What's happened? The girl sitting three seats behind you has been robbed as she slept. The honey-colored girl with the diamond pendant? Yes. Only her pendant no longer contains a diamond. Stolen, huh? Yes. Her name is Miss Terry Shaw, and she's booked through to New York. I see. By the way, what's your name? Jane. Jane March. Oh. Well, tell me, Jane, there's a Colonel Tolliver on the plane. What's his destination? Chicago. And how far out of Chicago are we now? Mm, nearly an hour. Ah, then we have to work fast. Let's go and talk to Miss Shaw. I'll lead the way, Jane. She's waiting in the galley nook at the rear of the cabin. Hello again. Hello. I, I hear you're in trouble. Yes, the diamond's been stolen from my attendant. Um... Mr. Hood, I'm sorry I was so abrupt with you earlier on. Oh, that's all right, Terry. My approach must have seemed a little startling. May I look at your pendant? Yes. Here, as you see, the diamond was pried out of its setting. At least, anyway, it would only have taken a second. When did you go to sleep, Miss Shaw? About an hour ago. And you're sure the pendant was intact then? Well, yes, Mr. Hood. I went forward in the cabin to return a magazine. 
After I'd come back to my feet, I remember fingering the diamond as I dozed off. Mm. Jane, do you remember how many people on this plane passed Miss Shaw's seat in the last hour? Well, I only noticed two. The gray-haired lady sitting up in front and Colonel Tolliver, the man you were asking about, Mr. Hood. Oh, well, I'll have a little talk with him. But before I do, I want to ask you to look at this note, Terry. As you see, the message on it is scribbled in lipstick of the exact shade that you're using. What's the Colonel? You didn't write that, Terry? No, I certainly didn't. That's odd. Well, before we start disturbing any of the other passengers, I'll have a talk with Colonel Tolliver. I know he's a phony. I'll go back to your seat, Miss Shaw, and pretend to be asleep. Very well, Mr. Wooden. Thank you. And, Jane, you pretend to be preoccupied with your coffee jugs. I don't want him to smell a rat. Right you are, Mr. Hood. Uh, Colonel. Colonel Tolliver. <coughs> uh, did you address me, sir? Yes. Oh, it is Mr. Gregory Hood, my friend from the airport. Uh, sit down, sir. I, I can't, Colonel. I need your help. My help, sir? A man's fainted in the restroom. I can't get him out by myself. I wonder if you'd come back there and give me a hand. Why, of course, sir. Colonel Tolliver, Virginia, has never wanted to refuse a helping hand, sir. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, here we are, Colonel. <coughs> Poor fellow, I do hope that... Well, there's no one here, sir. Just the two of us. It's cozier that way, Colonel. Mr. Hood, sir, this is an outrage. You all is no gentleman. And you all is no southerner. You all is a jewel thief. If I were a younger man, sir, I'd fashion... Skip it, skip it, skip it, and tell me where you've hidden the ice. I'll repeat, sir. If you're not going to play ball, you fugitive from central casting, I'm going to search. As you pointed out, I'm younger than you all are, and I don't think you can do anything about it. Yes, I can, Hood. I've got a gun on it. Yeah, but you're not very handy with that gun, are you? Thanks, I'll take care of it. Why do you wear a shoulder holster when you can't draw fast? What do you want, Hood? Ah, goodbye, Virginia. Brooklyn, here I come. I want Miss Shaw's diamond. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, reach. Reach up your hands. That's it. Now turn around. Now start your strip tease, brother, and don't bother to get coy about it. Come on, come on. Off with your coat and toss it back to me. There. Thanks. Would somebody's going to teach you a lesson one of these days? I regard my schooling as adequate, thank you. Now the best. Okay, good. You win this time. Diamonds in the vest pocket. Ah. Oh, so it is. By the way, Colonel, what's your real name? John Doe. What an unusual moniker. What are you going to do, Hood? Return this diamond to Miss Shaw. The rest is up to her. Now I'll leave you to make yourself a little more presentable. I'll keep your revolver. Don't try and run away, will you? We're about two miles above the earth, you know. Raided, Hood. A sense of humor doesn't appeal to me. Why, Colonel Tolliver, sir, you all is no gentleman. Yes, Jane, I got it. Oh, wonderful. Perhaps you can persuade Miss Shaw not to prosecute. Our airline would certainly appreciate it if you didn't. The publicity would be bad. Well, I'll see what I can do. Oh, I'm so grateful to you. Oh, hello, Terry. Mr. Hood, what's happened? Call me Gregory, won't you? After all, I have a present for you. Oh, you recovered it, Gregory. Yes, yes, here you are. It was reposing in the best pocket of the so-called Colonel Tolliver. You're sure it's the same stone? Of course I am. Gregory, I'm so grateful to you. Grateful enough not to prosecute the thief? Oh, I won't prosecute him. I've got the diamond back. That's all that matters. Good girl. I'll go and tell Jane that the fine name of Continental Airlines has been saved, and I'll let the colonel know that he can stop trying to make a parachute out of his shirt. Gregory, how can I repay you? Well, Terry, I can think of an appropriate reward. Oh? What is it? Your, uh, your lipstick still intrigues me, you know. Mm -hmm. Does it? Well, then... Why not do something about it, Jane? Thanks, Terry. I rather think I will. Sandy. Wake up, yeah. Sandy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, we're coming okay. into the airport at Chicago. Oh, are we, Greg? Yes. Oh, why? Well, well, Greg. <sighs> A nice, quiet trip after all. Oh, yes, yes, very quiet. All that's happened since you've been asleep is that the diamond's been stolen from a very beautiful girl. And I've just recovered it for her. Her gratitude was bound to A diamond was stolen? Oh, great, you're kidding. I'm perfectly serious. Well, 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 tell me about it. Okay, and I'll start at the most interesting point. As you know, in my trade, I've had to develop a good eye for gems. Uh-huh. And I'll swear by my old father's finest brandy that the diamond which I recovered is not the same stone as the one that was stolen. No. Sandy, 
this case has only just started. You'll hear the rest of Gregory Hood's story in just a second. And right now is a swell time for me to tell everyone who enjoys good food how to make chicken taste even better. And that is, serve it with Petri California Sauterne. Ah, yes, a glass of Petri Sauterne and chicken fried till it's crispy and brown or roasted with a savory stuffing. What a combination. Petri Sauterne, you know, is an unusual white wine, beautifully golden in color. And what a flavor that Petri Sauterne has. Subtle, intriguing, really delicious. Believe me, you don't know how good chicken can be, or for that matter, how good fish and seafood can be, until you've served them with Petri Sauterne. And just make sure it is Petri Sauterne, because all Petri wines are good wines. Well, Greg, you had me fool there. I thought your story was nearly over. So there were two diamonds involved. Yes, Harry, and one of them was still at large, the one that I'd seen originally in Miss Shaw's pendant. But why did she claim the wrong diamond is hers? That's what I had to find out, Harry, and that's why, as we filed out of the plane for a half an hour stop at Chicago, I tapped the supposed Colonel Pollard on the shoulder. Huh? Uh, leave me alone, Hood. She won't prosecute. You got nothing on me? My friend here is an attorney. What do you say, Sandy? Well, maybe we could get him on carrying a concealed weapon, Jim. Right? You guys lay off of then me. Then tell me one thing, my fine, spurious Virginia ham. You know darn well that the diamond I lifted off you was not stolen from that girl. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. But once I'd found it, you didn't protest. Obviously, its true origin won't bear going into. But why did the girl... I said to leave me alone. I don't know anything. Well, that's the last we see of the colonel. Stewart has told me Chicago's his destination. But the girl's going on to New York. Somewhere between here and there, I'm going to get to the bottom of it. Oh, Greg, leave well enough alone. You were probably wrong, and it was the same guy. Uh Uh-uh, Sandy. All my bloodhound instincts were at work. In the meanwhile, though, I'll take advantage of being on terra firma again and light this pipe. (laughs) Hey, uh, what's going on over there? Looks like a fight. Uh, Well, come on, Sandy. Why, it's Terry Shaw. Somebody slugged her. Stewardess is bending over. Jane, Jane, what happened? It's that Colonel Tolliver. He struck Miss Shaw, snatched her bag, and got away. And that bag had the diamond in it. Let's see if we can catch him, Sandy. There's not a chance. There he goes, Greg. Up the fence and into a waiting car. All part of a prearranged plan, darn it. Let's get to a phone and call the police. Is she going to be all right, Jane? Yes, she's just fainted. Oh, well, look after her. We'll get to the nearest phone. Very well, Mr. Bush. We've got to try and head him off, Sandy. Yeah, sure, but how? We haven't got the license number of the car. We don't even know what he looks like under those false whiskers. I know, I know, but he must be a known criminal in Chicago. I wonder if... Sandy, we watched him at the airport bar in San Francisco. Which hand was he using to hold his glass? Uh, which hand? Yeah. Uh, the right. Exactly. And yet his revolver was in a shoulder holster under the right armpit for the left hand. Ambidextrous, huh? Then you better let me get on that phone. Why? You know your methods, Greg. Hmm? Find out what you need to know and ask the right guy. Okay. There's a lawyer friend of mine who knows every crook in Chicago. At this hour, I should find him at Joe the Angel City Hall Bar. Give me a nickel, Greg. What? This is Hood Company business. Joe the Angel City Hall Bar. The Angel speaking. Is John J. Malone there? Oh, sure. It's for you, Mr. Malone. Okay, slide the phone over, Angel. Malone speaking. Uh, this is Sanderson Taylor. Sandy, how are you? What brings you to town? I'm on my way through to New York. Say, listen, Malone, I need some help. And I need a fee. Bear that in mind, Sandy. What's your problem? Well, Greg and I are on the trail of a jewel fee. All I can tell you is that he's ambidextrous and he's a rotten actor. Where does the acting come in? He's been posing as a southern colonel. And it was a most unconvincing performance. Oh, I know the man. That's an old trick of his. His name is Keister, better known as Ice Keister. I've defended him five times and got him off four. What's he been up to? Well, he made a snatch and grab out here at the airport a few minutes ago. Uh, say, does he have a hideout near here? Yes, back of a warehouse on the city road. It's just a shack kitty cornered across from a bar called the Purple Cow. The Purple Cow. Well, fine. Much obliged, Malone. I'll see you on the way back. Fine. I hope you catch him, Sandy. Yeah, so do we. Yeah, but my motives are different. If you catch him, he'll be sure to hire me. And that blonde hat check girl at the casino has such expensive taste. So long, Sandy. Well, there's the 
purple cow. Uh Uh-huh. And here's the warehouse. Malone said his hideout was at the back of it. Come on, then. You still have his revolver? Yes, now keep it handy. I'm afraid he'll feel a little frustrated when he sees us again. Uh, This must be the shack, right? Yeah. No lights on. Maybe he's not coming here after all. They might have driven around to shake off anyone tailing him. And we've gotten here first. Could be. But uh, don't take any chances. Come on. Uh-huh. Hmm. Front door's locked. This window's open. Oh, yeah. We can lift the lower sash. There we are. Now, I may take it easy. Don't make too much noise. I'll strike a match, Greg. Keep it below window level. We don't want to advertise our presence. Well, I guess this is what passes for the living room. Let's sit down and wait for them. Here. Here's a car now, Greg. Hmm? And it's turning into the alley, too. Yes, it's him, all right. We've timed this perfectly, Sandy. Got your gun handy? It's pointing straight at the front door. <laughs> What's more, Jake? I lay your eyes that this hood guy's feeling pretty darn stupid right now. <laughs> he doesn't feel so bad, Colonel Ice Keister. Hood! Up with your hands, you all. We're going to prefer charges this time, Keister. A little matter of assault at the airport. Hood, for Pete's sake, how did you track me here? I have an overdeveloped bump of location. And now, boys, you can tell us the way to the nearest police station. And I'm sure you won't need a street guide to do it. Continental Airlines, flight 234 for New York, loading in 10 minutes at gate 4. Well, how convenient that the plane was delayed half an hour. They might have gone off without us. As it is, we've time for a drink. What will it be? Well, I'll have a glass of sherry. Two dry sherries, please. Yes, sir. Say, Greg, you still think there was another diamond? I know there was, Sandy. Well, where the heck is it? I wish I knew. I... Well, hello. Look who's coming in. Oh, well, it's Miss Shaw. Oh, Gregory, you really are wonderful. The stewardess tells me you got my purse back. Yes, Terry, and the diamond. Oh, uh, do you care for a drink? We're not loading for ten minutes. What are you having? Sherry. I'll have the same. Make that three sherries, please. Coming up. How are you feeling, Miss Shaw? That blow didn't do any visible damage. Well, I think I just fainted with fright. Well, I must say my chin's awfully sore. Well, I'm glad you're all right, Terry. Oh, Sandra, do you have some tobacco? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. In the midst of all this excitement, I've forgotten to have that pipe, I promised myself. Have time for at least a third of a pipe full before we get on the plane. Before you light that monstrosity, I've got a reward to give you for getting my bag back. Mm -hmm. Uh, Turn your head a moment, Mr. Taylor, please. Oh, oh, dear me. (laughs) Yes, good. Aren't you afraid of shocking the barkeep, Terry? His back's turned. Gregory. Uh, Turn around, Sandy. This is interesting, Miss Shaw. Your lips might make a man forget almost anything, but I think it's a little odd that the girl I'm kissing should reach for the pipe in my breast pocket. Huh? What are you talking about, Greg? You'll soon see. I'll smoke that pipe now, at last. But, but Greg, yes? well, I... No, don't worry, darling. The heat won't damage your diamond. Well, Greg, what do you mean? Look at the result of my fondness for outsized pipe bowls. See what's been hiding in here, Sandy? Oh, oh great Scott. It's the original diamond. Sure it is. This cunning young lady went to the front of the cabin to return a magazine, she said. Actually, she slipped the diamond out of its setting, hid it in the bowl of my pipe while I was sleeping, and then reported it stolen. You must admit it was clever, Greg. Oh, it was brilliant. Too bad your cleverness has led you on the wrong side of the law. Yes, but Greg, why? Well, think what she accomplished. The searching of the colonel and the acquisition of his diamond. Then she did write that message in lipstick. Sure, she put the finger on the colonel, knowing that he'd thereby become the first suspect. The prettiest hijacking trick I've ever seen. I was rather proud of it. You knew that Keister was carrying the loot from San Francisco to Chicago, and you devised this plot whereby I, in person, should lift the loot from him and return it to you. Yes, but the original diamond, the one that she took out of her pendant and hid in your pipe while you were asleep. She knew that she'd intrigued me sufficiently to find an opportunity to get it back before I discovered it. Donna, Greg, you've ruined a beautiful plan. Mm. Well, a young woman, in all my experience in law, I've never seen such complete self-possession. Well, you're an admitted thief. Have you no conscience? Absolutely none. What are you going to do, Greg? 
The original diamond is presumably yours. You may keep it here. The other diamond, the one I listed from Keista, I shall return to the San Francisco police. Doubtless, they'll know where it came from. And what are you going to do about me? Sandy, you're my attorney. I imagine we can prosecute, can't we? Oh, yes, yes, we can, but I know what happened. Mm -hmm. She'd simply say she'd made a mistake in identifying the Jew, smiled at the jury, cross her legs a couple of times, and walk out. Here's your drink, folks. Oh, yes, thank you. Well, you ask me what I'm going to do with you, Terry. I'm neither a representative of the law or a moralist. But if you do get away with this, I warn you, I shall be on your trail. Oh, sounds cozy. Crime really doesn't pay, darling. I'll make it my mission to prove that fact to you. Oh, conscientious, aren't you? In the meanwhile, I'm going to drink a toast to you. I pledge the good fortune which has presented me with such an ingenious and attractive criminal antagonist. It's been fun crossing swords with you. Thank you, sir. And I shall drink to a return engagement, Gregory. And I shall drink to the amazing good fortune that has enabled Gregory Hood and Company to be successful when it's headed by a sentimental idiot. Amen to that, Sandy. Well, story, Greg, but, uh, say, do you really think you'll see her again? Absolutely. There was one little thing I did to make sure of it. You wouldn't by some chance mean that bit of romancing you handed out is a surefire way to bring her back. Harry, that's the obvious way. Okay, you were more subtle. What was? It's only my deep friendship that leads me to setting things up for you like this, Harry. Remember that drink I bought her? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't ice water, old man. (laughs) Smart stuff, Gregory. And if she's as smart as she seemed, she knows that the Petri wine you undoubtedly bought her is good wine. Why, it's got to be. Look at the long years of skill and experience that go into its making. The Petri family has been making wine for generations. Winemaking is their heritage. A heritage handed down from father to son, from father to son. So you can see why the Petri business has grown and grown so that today the Petri family are America's largest independent winemakers. Yes, the making of Petri wine is a family affair, and the Petri family has every intention of keeping it just that. So you know the name Petri on a bottle of wine is more than a trademark. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family that Petri wine is and always will be good wine. Well, Greg, what page of the case book are you turning to for next week's story? A page that has the heading, The Adventure of the Venerable Thug. It concerns a certain hilarious convention that took place in San Francisco and a strange series of happenings that lead a crooked trail to murder. See you next Monday, Greg. And the Monday after that, no doubt. Harry, what do you suppose you'll be doing ten years from now? Oh, uh, what? <laughs> no, don't mind me. I was just musing about all the people who will have their dreams realized ten years from now. You know, a college education for their children, or a new home, or maybe a trip abroad. A rich uncle. Exactly, Harry. A rich Uncle Sam who's going to pay them $4 for every $3 they put into savings bonds today. Really, I can't think of a better way to invest your money than in United States savings bonds. Good night. Book of Gregory Hood is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Original music composed and played by Dean Fossler. Gail Gordon plays the part of Gregory Hood, and Sanderson Taylor is played by Howard McNear. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week Same time, same station. The casebook of Gregory Hood comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane 
followed immediately by The Casebook of Gregory Hood. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.